Welcome to Cannabis Business Minds Podcast with your host, Simone Samaluka Radzin. Join me where I'll take you inside the ins and outs of this brand new and exciting business called cannabis. Connect with me on Calagia.com and follow us on social media as well. And here's today's show. Hello, Cannabis Business Minds. This is your host, Simone Samaluka Radzins, and I'm excited to chat with you guys on 420 today. Um, apologies for the delay in podcast. It has been a whirlwind of the last, honestly, the last four months. Uh, the last four months, 2018, from a business perspective, has been great. Um, from a new venture perspective, has been great. And from a cannabis legalization in California standpoint, has been kind of slow. Um, so in California, I know we focused so much of our time last um, last season on California and what was happening um, with the legalization. And I've, I'm sure a lot of uh, you guys have been, you know, if you're in California, have been able to go and see what the adult use market's like. But on the back end with B2B, it's really relatively slow. I know a lot of my clients uh, and a lot of cannabis operators are still, you know, actually even in the application process right now to get a license locally. Um, and then once that happens, then they'll have they're going to have to do a build out, get ready to actually go for production. So um, I think a little, I think a lot of us realize this, but now I guess we're actually seeing it, you know, that regulation in business, there's just always that, that hiccup, that hiccup in, in growing into a new market and uh, you know, what exactly is required. Um, I know that there's been more than 5,000 licenses that have been issued in the state of California. Um, and that, you know, there is definitely a thriving market, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, like every regulated state, uh, cannabis compliance is one of the biggest things um, that people kind of need to worry about. And the cannabis seed to sale tracking uh, system metric, uh, it still hasn't been completely installed or implemented into California. So that's probably going to be one of the hiccups uh, a little bit later down the road. But there is so much exciting stuff that's still happening. And, you know, just like everything, I always tell everybody, it's just the very beginning. I know that we've had the longest history of, uh, especially in California, you know, 20 plus years of truly a market that's existed. Yes, we've self-regulated, but definitely a market. Um, and for some of us, it does seem that it's been a very long time. But, you know, with new legalization and honestly, how I see it, federal legalization on the horizon, guys, we're just at the beginning of it. So if you're just listening to this for the first time, or if you really haven't started your cannabis business yet, um, I'd say don't worry, but start kind of planning and, and really figuring out how can you get involved in this. And so from the Calagia standpoint, I'm super excited. We That's also one of the reasons why I haven't been able to do so many podcasts. We have been hustling. like We have a new platform, a whole new solution, um, and we're really here here to help build, uh, build jobs, you know, help the cannabis operators find the great talent. But really, if you're looking uh, to work in cannabis operations, uh, if you're in administrative services, if you're in manufacturing services, if you're a scientist, if you're honestly anybody that wants to be involved in the cannabis business, make sure you register for Calagia. It's free and um, it's an opportunity. I mean, we're launching our new platform very soon. It's a huge opportunity uh, for you get to get connected, not only with some of the workshops that we have and all that stuff, but with a potential job. Uh, so that's how I see it. But today is 420, and you will not be listening to this on 420, but you'll be listening to this soon, and I hope everybody had a 420, great 420. Um, but with the theme of that, and with the theme of, honestly, how I'm seeing things um, personally, um, but from a business perspective of where the market's heading, I want to focus today's show on cannabis legalization. And, you know, I think for many people, there's always the myths of what 420 is. Was it a, was it, you know, the time when some students in California would go meet each other and smoke a joint at 420? Was it the police code that, you know, you use for cannabis or was it something else? Um, but notwithstanding whatever myth it is of the really true origin of 420, we all know that if we're in the cannabis industry, yes, it's a very fun uh, recreational holiday for us. But, you know, I think for many of us, it's uh, 
it's the legalization of cannabis. And so I thought, how fitting would it be to talk on today's podcast about the history of hemp and cannabis and take you guys through a little bit of a journey of an Excel spreadsheet, but I promise it won't be a boring journey of hemp and cannabis history in the United States. Um, so, you know, I speak internationally and I was preparing, uh, I, I love spreadsheets. I'm a CPA, so of course I love spreadsheets, but I was preparing for a presentation a few years back and um, I just, I'm so curious about, you know, cannabis, you know, why it's been prohibited. I mean, there's definitely reasons why, you know, but I wanted to know, you know, I want to know the facts. I want to know the history behind certain things. I want to know when they happened. I want to know who was involved. I wanted to know something. So I created this massive spreadsheet, 500 lines or more. So we're not going to go over any, all of that today, because I know we only have about 30 minutes. Um, but we're going to go talk about, you know, the very origin of you know, starts in 1619, guys, um, in the United States that hemp legalization was passed. So we're talking more than 400 years from today when, you know, hemp is CBD, which is the 0.3% THC that we're still getting, you know, a lot of fluff, or not fluff, but flack, I suppose, um, from the federal government. So interesting enough, 1619 hemp legalization in the United States was passed. And you know what? Our founding fathers, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson in 1774 and 1797, both those gentlemen were growing uh, hemp. Uh, so at Mount Vernon, George Washington uh, was growing hemp as his primary crop in 1797. And so... That's very fascinating, but I want to rewind a little bit back to the 1619 because I got too excited and I was jumping ahead. Um, so 1619 hemp legalization was passed. That same year, Virginia passes legislation requiring every farmer to grow hemp. And hemp at that time was allowed to be exchanged as legal tender in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland. And so if that's I mean, that is fascinating, right? So that's, you know, more than 400 years. And so in 1850, so we'll kind of, we'll scooch up a bit, a few 200 years, um, but marijuana was added to the U.S. Uh, pharmacopoeia. And an introduction to medical preparations of cannabis was used in, you know, to be used in Western medicine was actually introduced during that time. And it was listed that marijuana could be the treatment for numerous, um, numerous ailments, including, and I'm honestly not going to pronounce all these correctly, so bear with me, but including tetanus, typhus, cholera, rabies, uh, dysentery, alcoholism, opioid addiction guys you know with that podcast with 80 po 80 posts so we're hearing in 1850 and this is all documentation right and marijuana was added to the u.s pharmacopoeia and one of the ailments was to help fight opioid addiction okay and then gout insanity <laughs> excessive menstrual bleeding um and among others right and so interesting enough we're talking 1850 this was added in and guys, this is a 500 uh, line uh, timeline. We're not going to go over all of it. Just the most important that I thought for the legalization of cannabis. So we'll fast forward a little bit to 1906. And in 1906, the United States required the labeling of cannabis. So there was the Pure Food and Drug Act that required labeling of any cannabis to, that contained, um, that was to be over the counter. Okay, so very interesting that the actual labeling was required. I'm seeing this right now with our with our clients in California about the correct labeling. So, you know, 1906, uh, the United States was requiring this uh, for cannabis. And so in 1913, California passes the first state marijuana law. And California passed the first state marijuana law, though it was missed by many people because it was referred to um, – to the as the preparations of hemp or loco weed and and th these are quotes right so this is this is me taking it from books and all this stuff so um a lot of people probably didn't understand what that was and just interesting enough the terminology loco weed um this is uh 1910 was when the Mexican Revolution started. So interesting enough, just kind of the play on loco and Spanish and, and all of that. 
Um, but you know, 1913 is a very busy year actually in this whole timeline. So even though California passes this law, Indiana, Maine, Wyoming, they all ban cannabis. Okay. And at that same time, the United States, um, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture grows its first domestic cannabis. So the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture announced that it had succeeded in growing domestic cannabis of equal quality to the Indians uh, or to India. And when foreign supplies interrupted World War I, the U.S. became self-sufficient in cannabis. By 1918, some 60,000 pounds were produced annually, all for pharmaceutical farms east of the Mississippi. Isn't that fascinating? So again, like, it's just curious to see kind of this play of actually what was happening uh, in the early 1900s. So 1915, California decides, hey, you know what, we're going to ban cannabis consumption for non-medical purposes. Um, so they became the first state uh, to ban cannabis consumption for non-medical purposes. Um, that's interesting. You might be asking like, well, what about the stuff in Indiana and Maine uh, in 1913 when, where cannabis is banned? I, I honestly can't tell you. Um, this is a, a working timeline. And if anybody's interested in helping me in this, uh, please, I'd love to get your comment. Um, but between 1915 and 1930, really a lot of states are now banning cannabis. Um, we're talking Utah, Vermont, Colorado, Nevada, Texas, Louisiana, uh, New York, I think I already mentioned, as well as, you know, that's when the UK in 1928 uh, banned marijuana. And so in 1932... Cannabis concerns arise in the United States. So, um, you know, can it, so this is what I, I found is that concerns about the rising use of marijuana and research linking its use with crime and other social problems created pressure on the federal government to take action. So as you can see, like during this like 1913 to the 1932, so many states were kind of banning cannabis. And so the, you know, clearly the federal government is kind of getting this push to, um, to do something about it. Um, rather than promoting federal legalization, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics strongly encouraged state governments to accept responsibility for control of the problem by adopting the Uniform State Narcotic Act, and that's in 1932. 1933, alcohol prohibition ends, right? So interesting enough, we've already seen that, you know, cannabis... Um, I forget where I was reading this, but this is... Now I'm going to take you back to 2018 really quick. Cannabis um, really for a lot of the adult use market, it's going to take away a huge portion of the alcohol revenue stream, right? So it's interesting to see, you know, how the cannabis concerns in the night in the United States are happening. 1932, 1933 alcohol prohibition uh, is ending. Right. And so just curious to see the, the trend in that. And then at that same time, uh, 1933, you know, marijuana is really becoming the target of government control. Um, there's sensationalistic stories linking violent acts to cannabis consumption, right? So we're already kind of seeing a little bit uh, geared towards the reefer madness. So 1934, the Garrison Act, which is a very interesting thing, um, was passed. And that was passed um, by the United States, so on the federal level, um, to outlaw marijuana marijuana and other drugs. 1936, the famous movie Reefer Madness is released. And then in 1936, marijuana is replaced by other pain relievers. Um, so interesting enough, it's like cannabis was obviously in whatever that was, the 1850s adopted by the U.S. Pharmacopoeia to, you know, what we talked about, opioids, pain relief, gout, all of these things. And then all of a sudden, alcohol kind of becomes uh, back into the scene if the federal prohibition ends. And then 1936, you know, we're also seeing now kind of more of the pharmaceuticals and the pain, pain relievers and all that kind of stuff replace cannabis use. Um, 1937, so just a year later, um, you know, marijuana is removed from the U.S. pharmacopoeia. And uh, so it, it lost all of its, you know, uh, legitimacy as a, as a benefit there, which is interesting because um, in 1937, the American Medical Association really supported the research on cannabis. So it's curious kind of to see those, uh, those linkages. And 
and you fast forward it, you know, a little bit to um, just the jail sentencing and understanding after. So we see in the 1940s, you know, the war is just about ending. You know, we were using hemp. The Hemp for Victory program was actually launched uh, to use hemp to, to help with World War II. And then we're seeing after the World War II in the 1950s, um, one, two very important things that Ohio so in 1951, the United States, they decide to pass this Boggs Act. And the Boggs Act, basically what it did is it lumped marijuana and nar narcotic drugs together, and it provided uniform penalties. So we're talking these mandatory minimum sentences uh, in prison. And so that would be for the possession of cocaine, heroin, cannabis, marijuana. Um, so that's in the 1950s. So that's when 1950s, that starts happening. 1955, I wanted to highlight this, highlight this is it's related to one state in particular, um, Ohio. Ohio increases the pr prison sentences for narcotic drugs um, to 20 to 40 years um, for the sentence of the sale of narcotic drugs, which is pretty scary. Um, in 1968, Mississippi is actually, despite all this like, you know, negative stuff about cannabis, the University of Mississippi is the official grower of marijuana for the United States government. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that program later and probably on a, another podcast episode. Um, but yeah, that's, so that's quite interesting. And then in 1970, um, our favorite control, controlled substance acts that we talk about a lot, you know, the controlled substance acts, um, that classified marijuana to have as a schedule one substance, which we'll talk about in a little bit to have no accepted medical use. So that's in the 1970s. And then um, 1972, the first report, and this is a very important thing. So that's when cannabis or marijuana is like, hey, you know what? Schedule one substance, no medicinal value. 1972, the first report of the National Commission on Marijuana was commissioned. And so I don't know if you guys have heard about this before, but it's very interesting. It's called the Schaefer Commission. And it was a 185-page report conducted that recommended that cannabis should be decriminalized for personal use and that personal cultivation be allowed among with the small transfer for no profit. Uh, the report does recommend that a regulatory body monitor and tax marijuana throughout the United States. And this report was rejected by Nixon and the U.S. Congress. Um, so very interesting. Um, 1973, the DEA is created. We know just from just being in the cannabis industry, the, the fear from Jeff Sessions and the DEA, and the DEA has done many things with cannabis eradication programs, and they, you know, they make their money from asset forfeitures and, um, you know, really kind of shutting down cannabis. Um, so that was 1973, and then fast forward to um, 1975, because this was, again, related to Ohio, how we mentioned um, the 20 years uh, sentencing. And so the Supreme Court ruled that it was not cruel to criminalize um, to, crim to basically punish somebody for 20 years for selling cannabis. Um, so that's pretty harsh when you think about um, that type of sentencing. And that's right around uh, the same time that Oregon actually decriminalized cannabis. So it's just curious to see within the United States um, the difference in opinions and cannabis and, and decriminalization versus punishing people for 20 years. Um, so we talked a little bit about, you know, what's up with the Mississippi and the University of Mississippi to actually do anything when it was federally illegal uh, to do anything with cannabis. And, you know, so they have this program. Uh, if you've seen Dr. Sanja Gupta's um, documentary that he did a few years ago, uh, you'll see a little bit more about the University of Mississippi. But, you know, in 1978, when we clearly said it's completely illegal. Nixon's, you know, all this like war on drugs is really, really about to happen, right? Um, the University of Mississippi delivers 300 joints a month to a patient. And uh, it's a very interesting story. I'll put that into the show notes, but I just wanted to highlight, <laughs> highlight that info. And so let's fast forward to 1980. And so we've talked about synthetic cannabis a little bit, right? And so synthetic cannabis, there's clearly the street synthetic cannabis, but there's also synthetic cannabis that pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical companies um, 
have, and it's called synthetic cannabis. And so one of the major ones was Marinol. And so in 1980, the National Cancer Institute began experiments with a new drug, Marinol. And in 1981, the U.S. agreed to sell Marinol. And so the, the government agreed to patent uh, Marinol and, um, and really use it, um, really really tried to sell it. Um, at that time, it applied the, to the FDA for permission to market the pill as a treatment for nausea. Uh, but in 1984, the DEA actually rejected that because um, the clinical tests uh, had not been, you know, they weren't actually that efficient. Um, so that's a very interesting thing. And Marinol is, you know, is still an active product. In 1986, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act is enacted. Um, so, you know, this is Reagan's now into office and Congress and President Ronald Reagan enact the Anti-Drug Abuse Act. And this really increased the mandatory minimum drug sentences on a federal level. And it was the first time that Congress passed mandatory minimum sentences since the Boggs Act that I mentioned in 1951. And so in 1988, Congress also passed a law permitting capital punishment when drug activity resulted in intentional killing. Um, so that's kind of the timeline of, of where those mandatory minimums also got started. And then, you know, from 1986 to 1996, um, you know, California really started trying to push. This is where, you know, kind of the AIDS epidemic happened and Ronnie Mary started happening. And so in 19... You know, really, I think the first initiative for um, cannabis in California was in 1991, and that was in San Francisco with Proposition P. It didn't pass, clearly, um, until California passed Proposition 215 to legalize medical cannabis in 1996. Guys, you know the rest of history. That's what we're, we're always kind of reading. It's like, oh, California was the first state, and then you kind of see the others. But I really wanted to give you some insight on to onto the history of, of legalization, um, or I guess prohibition, how we should say it. And it's very important to understand this because when you think about cannabis prohibition, you've got to think about the, you know, how, how many industries cannabis really does take on? I mean, we've already seen that cannabis, you know, from a, an adult use perspective would take on, you know, uh, alcohol from that respect. From a hemp perspective, it takes on uh, paper, it takes on food, it takes on cotton, it takes on many things. And then from a medical perspective, you know, we see in 1850, it was in the pharmaco pharmacopoeia, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, it was in, you know, 1850. It's, it's, you know, cannabis helps. I mean, we've talked about this so much. I think like why the cannabis industry has actually evolved to where it is right now is is not necessarily from the adult use perspective it is from the medical perspective that cannabis is helping with anxiety cannabis is helping with sleep cannabis is helping honestly with weight loss um and and cancer and epilepsy and the list goes on and on and on and so you know i wanted to beyond providing you guys this very interesting kind of overview of legalization and, and prohibition of cannabis, I think it's very important for everybody to understand this because we are moving at a very fast pace towards federal legalization. Um, one of the things that I wanted to call to everybody's attention is that on April 23rd, the FDA is asking for a public comment um, on why and not on why, but on the classification or declassification of cannabis. Um, guys, I was going to say, ladies and gentlemen, everybody that's listening, this is so, so big. Um, it's big because I want to talk you really quickly through um, where we do not in my opinion, as an entrepreneur, as a, a definitely a medical advocate, but a, a legalization more advocate, where we do not want to see cannabis at and where we would like to see it. I mean, in my opinion, I think cannabis needs to be clearly regulated uh, because 
when you do con, uh, concentrates, when you do extractions, like we had that episode last year about, you know, 93% of the contra- concentrates tested had pesticides in them. We don't know the science behind it, right? And so we definitely need to have support to do a lot of this research from the federal government, but we do not, in my opinion, want cannabis to be classified as a Schedule II substance. And the reason behind that is how fast this is moving. And A, there's already these adult use markets, so I think it would be a a pretty big fight if that happened, is that that would fully go to pharmaceuticals. Um, You know, a Schedule II, so in case you're listening and you're like, well, Simone, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, what are these, what's the scheduling of, uh, what's the Controlled Substance Act anyway? So I told you a little bit about the history of the Controlled Substance Act. And so what it is, is that there are, five levels of uh, controlled substances, one through five. Okay, cannabis right now is uh, listed as a level one. And so that means the definition of level one under the Controlled Substance Acts is that there's it's drugs with no current accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. So what's listed? Heroin, LSD, marijuana, ecstasy, meth, and peyote. And so... Um, we all know that cannabis definitely shouldn't be on that. And I'm sure many of you would argue, well, maybe some of those others shouldn't be as well. Schedule two is a high potential for abuse with use potentially leading to severe psychological or physical dependence. And so what's a schedule two? Cocaine, Vicodin, meth, meth, um, methamphetamine. So schedule one was methaqualin. I don't know what that is. Um, fentanyl, which we already know is causing a huge amount of the opioid addictions. Um, Adderall and Ritalin. A schedule three is a high potential for abuse with use potentially leading to severe psychological or physical dependence. Um, and so that is not much different really than, um, a schedule two, but Tylenol, codeine, ketamine, steroids, testosterone, all of those um, in 2016, I haven't updated this in 2018, um, were considered uh, schedule three. What I find interesting is that schedule four and schedule five, um, those have low potential for abuse and low risks of dependence. And that's like a Xanax, an Ambien, uh, Tremadol. And so where I get very curious about, um, and I'd love to know everybody else's opinions on this, is, you know, I don't understand first the scheduling um, at all, but when you look into um, the symptoms of some of the drugs that are listed um, as a Schedule 2 or Schedule 4, I mean, there's like, I was going through this like crazy detail. I mean, it's like uh, on a Schedule 5 or excuse me, on a schedule four, for example, like some of the symptoms are, you know, um, death and overdose and, and addiction. And so I don't understand, you know, a, why it's, why it would be needed. Cannabis would ever be needed to be a schedule one or two. And so it's very important that when we, that when you do do something with the FDA and please, if you'd like uh, the letter that we're sending the FDA um, to send as well, or if you'd like to comment on this letter, please let me know. Uh, Simone, S I M O N E at Calagia.com. It's very important that we do take action guys on, I mean, we're right now part of history. And so I, my thought is the FDA is looking to understand, um, you know, and looking to understand, but with a very good dossier of why cannabis should be removed and descheduled. Um, and I'd love to, to collaborate on all of this stuff with you guys. Um, and the reason why they're looking right now is that in December of 2017, right? So five months ago, this was huge um, for the UN. So the UN basically did its initial study and they... Um, they did their initial study and they said that CBD should not be scheduled as a controlled substance. Um, So that's where I'm thinking that the FDA is kind of leaning towards is that they're already seeing what's happening on an international level and they are just trying to figure out um, what they would 
that how they would kind of match and mirror um, hopefully the World Health Organization. And it's interesting because um, the World Health Organization has not released its final report of, of their stance on cannabis and cannabis resin, extracts and tinctures, and we're going to see that in June. So guys, how I see all this, I see that cannabis legalization on a federal level is going to be happening so much sooner than a lot of us thought. Um, in April alone, there were three major positive things that made me even more compelled to think this. So on April 11th, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to the news, but the former House Speaker John Boehner, who's been a longtime opponent of marijuana legalization, announced that he's going to be serving on a board of advisors for a cannabis company. And the cannabis company, I've actually, I'm going to try to get them actually on the podcast, um, is called Acreage Holdings. And they've got licensed cannabis facilities all in the, um, in the United States. I think they've got, um, their facilities in 11 States. Okay. So that was one very interesting piece of information. Then on April 13th, Mitch McConnell introduces the hemp bill in the Senate. And so right now the hemp bill would not legalize, um, cannabis for recreational or medical uses on a federal level, but it would allow for non-psychoactive forms of cannabis. So apparently there must've been some issues with the farm bill in 2014, but as it stands, as I mentioned earlier, you know, farmers face several barriers to growing hemp right now due to its federal prohibition. And, you know, that's the access to banking. It's 280E because it's still considered, um, it's still considered cannabis. Cannabis is a schedule one, 280E exists on schedule one and two substances. Um, and the hardest thing is that farmers that are even working in hemp and cannabis, they can't really find valid crop insurance for outdoor grows. We saw this happen during the wildfires of um, in California where there were so many poor farmers that um, lost everything and didn't have crop insurance. Um, so really having this, if this hemp bill could go and actually get approved, um, this would be so huge for um, hemp farmers in, in the United States. And we all know with legalization comes jobs. And so the last thing that happened, which was last week, is that um, a senator from Colorado, Cory Gardner, announced publicly that President Donald Trump has committed to him that the Department of Justice rescission of the Cole Memo, which was a a huge blow for so many of us um, because the Cole Memo protected states with legal uh, cannabis from any federal like intrusion um, from the depart from the DEA. But he announced that you know Trump basically said that he. he I quote, President Trump has assured me that he will be, he will support a federalism based legislative, legislative, legislation solution to fix this state's rights issue once and for all. And that was for the Colorado market. So that means medical and adult use guys. And so if you add all these pieces of the puzzle together and you add in the FDA also asking us for our opinion as citizens, and I please, if you're listening to this and it's before April 23rd, please just go to the show notes. I will put the link in, um, even in the iTunes show notes um, of where you could submit this. Please, this is your civil responsibility as a citizen that wants to participate in cannabis like business. Definitely, definitely put in your comments. Uh, because guys, how I see it is that if all of this stuff is happening, more and more states are coming on board, right? Um, Utah and Oklahoma just announced some stuff. We already see that in 18 in the in 1691. The U.S. allowed us to grow hemp. We even saw that it was in the pharmacopoeia, right, in 1850. Guys, we have something that is so amazing that we can come together and we can hopefully shape cannabis federal legalization in the way that we want to. And to me, this is so exciting. We are all part of history right now. If you're listening, you're like, I haven't done anything. You've listened to this and you know that you can make a change. Um, so I am super pumped with all of this kind of stuff. And I hope I didn't overwhelm 
all of you with uh, all these facts and all this data, but it's so important for you to understand, especially as it's on 420, um, what's happened uh, in the last 400 plus years in the United States with cannabis. It has been a very sad story of, you know, understanding that this plant can do so much for so many people. And unfortunately, we have struggled from the social justice issue of seeing people go to jail for crimes that really they shouldn't have been able to, that they shouldn't have gone to jail for. We've seen this at a disproportional rate for minorities. Um, we've seen that people have not had access to medicine, which in, you know, in the 1850s, they believed that cannabis could help with opioid addiction. And we're seeing this horrible opioid problem right now. So guys, I please, please, please ask you, make sure that you're preaching to the choir, not only to the choir, but to other people about the benefits of cannabis legalization. Um, so honestly, that's going to be a wrap for today's show. I am so pumped that you've listened to it. Again, um, we've got some amazing people lined up for um, for the next few weeks. I will be recording on a weekly basis. I'm recording every Friday, so a podcast should be dropping Monday at Monday to Tuesday um, at the latest. And guys, I really, it's so funny. Every one of my podcast guests is like, oh my God, I've been getting so many emails. I've been getting so many people to reach out. Please let me know. Shoot me an email, Simona Calagia.com. What kind of podcast do you want to hear? What are your problems in the cannabis industry? How can I help? And how can people in Calagia also help you? We're here for you. You know, we think that this is one of the most exciting times to be to be alive and to and to really do that hustle and to to do good things for not only America but for the world. Um, so thank you so much for listening to this episode of Cannabis Business Minds. I'm your host, Simone Samaluka Radzin. CEO of Calagia. And I look forward to talking with all of you guys, hopefully at one of our cannabis business boot camps, our cannabis finance boot camps, or even our May event uh, for cannabis women uh, in Santa Monica. So thank you so much and have a lovely, lovely day. And for all of you who are 420 fans, make 420 every day if you can be productive. I'll talk to you all later. Have a good, have a good day. And thank you all so much for listening to Cannabis Business Minds. I'm your podcast host, Simone Samaluka Radzins with Calagia. Connect with me on Calagia.com and we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to today's show. This is your host, Simone Samaluka Radzins of Calagia.com. I hope that you find this episode entertaining and insightful. My goal is to educate all of you about this exciting business because knowledge is power. If you haven't already, head on over to Calagia.com to connect with me and to meet other business leaders in the professional cannabis community. Also, if you like this, please go into iTunes and leave the Cannabis Business Minds podcast a five-star review. See you next episode.